Um, well, I'm very honored to be invited uh, here to share with you the, some of my research uh, observations about China's economy. Um, I'm an uh, economist um, focused on China's economy and uh, quarterly we publish uh, China's economy uh, observation. And I also focus on RMB exchange rate and also internationalization. And if you have any questions, uh, you can leave your, um, your uh, you can leave your questions um, in the box. I can uh, find it. Um, if uh, I hope you can actively <laughs> to raise many questions, although uh, I'm not sure whether I can cover all of the question. Um, so my presentation will be two parts. The first is about the outlook uh, and uh, an overview of China's macroeconomy. And the second part is about China's macroeconomic policy. Um, and you know, in March, in early March, uh, China has held a big uh, National People's Congress and the central government published the government report. I will, uh, I will also uh, talk about some of the government reports and uh, the outlook of policy framework. Uh, so first, uh, let me uh, introduce the macroeconomy uh, in China the, for the situation. <clears throat> um, because I'm not sure that whether, uh, so, so for all of our attendees, I'm not sure uh, whether you are from think tank or from business, uh, from company, uh, from government, I, I'm not clear. So if you uh, probably uh, my presentation uh, is not well targeted for your concern. Uh, so you can raise your question in a box. Uh, maybe I can um, cover more of your concerns. So the, the first part of my presen presentation is about the macroeconomic economy in China. What's the situation? And roughly China's GDP volume is very large, the second largest economy in the world. Uh, only second to the US, you know, the volume is um, 17 trillion US dollar last year. Um, and uh, the year before last year in 20, the volume is 15, 15 trillion. So the incremental of last year is more than two trillion. And, and this volume is as much as the GDP volume of Korea, uh, which is the one of the top, um, I think, top ten uh, uh, economy in the world. Um, so the GDP volume and the growth rates uh, both are very large uh, for China. But always, but uh, China's per capita GDP is relatively low. Um, before this presentation, I've, I have checked uh, the P per capita GDP of. Hungary uh, is about uh, 16,000 US dollar. But for China, you know, only 11, um, 11,000 US dollar. So China's per capita GDP is only 70% to Hungary. Uh, to Hungary. Uh, it's not as developed as Hungary uh, as a whole. Uh, but in China, it's quite a split country. Um, things are quite, quite different in different cities or different provinces. Um, one of the saying is that uh, you can find some cities are like Europe, some cities are like uh, some of the rural countries like Africa. Um, there's great regional gap and also a large income gap between different classes. Um, so China is quite a, quite a complicated uh, uh, country. Um, here as a, as a whole situation, China's GDP is very large, but the per capita GDP uh, is relatively low. We just come to the color of middle income country uh, according to the criteria of World Bank development indicator. Um, so this is the whole view and, the, uh, and for long view, but for the uh, short term view from the, uh, at the end of last year and uh, for the first quarter of this year, we have three main challenges uh, for the macroeconomy. The first challenge is for the supply shock. Um, probably you read the news about Shanghai. Actually, not only Shanghai uh, was locked down uh, in China, 
but all of the many, many cities um, involved in um, 15 provinces. You know, in China, there are only uh, um, the level of provinces only uh, 31. Uh, 15 of them uh, have cities being locked down in these days. So almost half, uh, but actually not so large a uh, uh, ratio uh, um, according to the city's level. Um, but uh, anyway, many cities are locked down. Uh, I think probably more than uh, 10, uh, probably 20, around 20 cities, uh, big or small. Um, and this is the supply shock. It has big impact on the uh, logistic and also a uh, big impact for the uh, production uh, order. And this is the uh, first challenge. The second challenge is about demand shock. Um, we usually we use the uh, indicator uh, of import, imports growth rate to uh, deliberate, to, to tell us uh, the demand shock. Um, in last year, the imports growth rate uh, as a whole year uh, is more than 20%. But in the first three months, the import growth rate declines substantially, uh, especially in the March, uh, imports growth rate declines to negative uh, area, uh, minus 2%. So it's a rather dangerous uh, signal uh, from my view, from my personal view, because the imports means the uh, very directly to the demand shock. Um, it means the aggregate of um, consumption, investments, and the government purchases. Um, put them together, uh, their imports are declining. Uh, this is the second shock. And the third shock is about expectation, uh, especially from the market. I mean, the household and uh, enterprises, uh, they are not so confident as before, as last year and the market expectation is rather weak. Uh, that's not good. This situation was clear, uh, was clear pointed out by the central government uh, document by the end of last year. Um, you know, there's a committee is, which is very influential to the uh, macroeconomy. It's called the Central uh, Economy and uh, Financial Committee. Um, this committee, um, in December last year, they have pointed out the three challenges I have mentioned before. And uh, recently I joined a meeting and the, of the high, uh, rank, high rank official, uh, they pointed it again that the three challenges are become more severe. Uh, we should carry out more uh, policy tools to uh, solve such kind of situation, to deal with it. So uh, this is the uh, from the short term's view, uh, there are three major challenges for China's macroeconomy. And uh, um, in the following, I will uh, decompose China's macroeconomy in the way of expenditure. I mean, uh, the expenditure of household, of the uh, investment, uh, consumption of the household, investment for the enterprises, and uh, uh, the external expenditure, that is the exports. Uh, from China. Um, first of all, the consumption uh, is rather weak. I know uh, that for the Western countries, especially in, um, in countries like Hungary, uh, in Europe and in North America, the inflation is rather high. Um, I have tracked just uh, one hour ago that the Hungary's CPI inflation in March uh, was, uh, was about 8.5 um, is rather high. Uh, in China, I think 10 years ago or 12 years ago, China has recorded a such high in CPI inflation. Uh, but in this, uh, in this year, it's rather low. Uh, in January and February, China's CPI inflation is only 0 0.9, even less than 1%, uh, extremely low. And in March, it goes up slightly but only 1.5%, still very low. Uh, but that's not means good. Um, and uh, the inflation is bad, uh, of course, but the low inflation uh, is not good because uh, that reflects the very weak domestic demand, uh, even um, especially in the household sector. 
So for China, our major challenge is not inflation, but the weak demand, especially the weak consumption demand. Um, but why uh, the consumption is so weak? <clears throat> I think uh, one of the reason is that uh, the expectation for income in the future is very weak. And the, the expectation of employment is also weak. Um, let's look at the unemployment ratio in China. Um, in every country, it's very, uh, it's very often to see that the young guys' unemployment ratio is always the highest uh, comparing with other uh, age. Um, and in China, if we find, if we look at the young guys uh, range from 16 years old to 24 years old, you will find the unemployment ratio is uh, in last month in March is more than 15 percent, and in uh, just uh, in December uh, 2019, the month before the pandemic, um, the the same um, um, the same unemployment ratio is only uh, 12, and now it's more than 15. That means the young guys are even difficult to uh, for them to find a job. Um, so this expectation for employment ratio is not optimistic. And uh, due to the lockdown in many cities, the service sector uh, was restricted. And uh, people uh, like me, uh, in, in, the, in the older days, I would like to travel around, travel for long distance. In, in these days, uh, we are, uh, it's, it's not possible or no, it's the, it will be very difficult for our to go travel. Uh, so the services related to the tourism or the daily life um, service sector was restricted. And uh, in this way, the employment and the income also influenced uh, very badly. And uh, uh, during the um, during the pandemic and the lockdown, you will find the income disparity also become uh, even serious because the um, um, because for the low uh, for the for the higher class people uh, they work in the uh, the billionaire or millionaire uh, they will be influenced less because. Um, their assets um, goes to the, um, produce uh, interests and uh, the asset price goes up. And for the people who work in the government, it's also okay, no problem. Uh, the government will pay you uh, as usual. But the people uh, work for their own uh, self. Um, I mean, the small and the middle um, enterprises and the, the people sell their goods on, along the streets. Um, their job and uh, income was a uh, bit uh, seriously. So the income disparity was expand um, to some extent. Um, and uh, if we put these um, shocks together, we will find, uh, we will find the um, results that the consumption is really weak. <clears throat> and uh, for China, um, our bailout, the government bailout to the household is quite different from the Western countries. I know uh, for the uh, major economies in uh, European countries and also in the North America, uh, even in Japan, Korea, um, the, the government bailout in 20 and 21 um, with large fiscal expenditure and uh, with the large deficits. Uh, of the Minister of Finance, but in China we also uh, we also do something uh, something like this uh, in the same way in 2020, but not so large amounts. Um, I think um, for um, our uh, Chinese in Chinese style for bailouts, uh, we bail out much more to the enterprises, to the market entity, not to the household. I think uh, roughly it's based on two kinds of uh, logic. One is that um, for China, our um, the statistic system is not as efficient as the uh, Western countries. Um, when you um, when you want to give money uh, from the central government or local government to the poor people, um, in European countries you have very 
um, you have very excellent system to facilitate such kind of redistribution, uh, uh, reallocation for the, for the money to bail out, directly give them to the poor people. But in China, it's so large a country and uh, um, the too huge population, it's very hard for the government to find the right people to give the right amount of money. Uh, it will be very costative. Uh, the cost is very high. And uh, naturally for the government, lo the logic is to uh, just to, stimul to stimulate the economy. And uh, uh, when the ent enterprises, they got profitable, uh, they will distribute their money to their uh, to the poor people uh, to make use more labor uh, for employment. Um, so this is the logic for China, the, the first point. And the second point, uh, uh, um, I think for the first point, uh, there's another uh, uh, to for complement. That is uh, some of the local governments, especially in the rural countries, there are corruptions. Um, some, some of the, uh, not all of the uh, local government, but some of the uh, government and not a small, not a small uh, minority. I think uh, there are corruptions. Um, when the central government give money to the local government, they could probably uh, just leave the money uh, for themselves, not distribute to the poor people. Um, so it will be another kind of cost for the central government. So this is also the logic to support uh, for the stimulation to enterprises. Not to the uh, not to the poor people directly, and the second logic is for China is still a developing country, um, not a developed country, um, and uh, our fiscal capacity um, is not so uh, rich, uh, not so uh, sustainable from the view of long run compared with uh, uh, U.S. or France or Germany because uh, US, uh, the US dollar is, um, world, um, is a world currency and for RMB is relatively uh, weak. And uh, for the central government is practical to, uh, to make use uh, the stimulation directly to the enterprises um, to finance to the production, not finance directly to the consumption. And actually for the, uh, both the local and the central government, they do uh, some, they did some uh, bailouts to consumption, but it's not, uh, not with a high, uh, high ratio. Uh, the major stimulation is goes, uh, is just the went to the um, enterprises sector. Um, so this, uh, but the result is uh, the consumption demand is rather weak uh, so far. Um, but we, we will see more and more uh, policies will carried out to stimulate consumption. <clears throat> and this is the first. Second is investment from the enterprises. Um, in China's fixed assets, fixed asset investment, there are three pillars. The first pillar is uh, manufacturing, and second is real estate. Last is uh, infrastructure investment by the government. Um, for the three pillars, if we put them together, uh, you will find they occupy about 70 to 80% of the total um, fixed asset investments. Um, so uh, the, the three pillars are very key, uh, very important to the investment and the, uh, also very significant to the total um, macroeconomy. Um, and if you look at the manufacturing investment, uh, it still um, keep at a very high level uh, because uh, the, the very strong external demand, I mean, the exports uh, support the manufacturing investment. In last year, the profits, the total profits uh, of the um, manufacturing sector is more than, uh, it's, it's around a nine trillion uh, RMB, not US dollar, <clears throat> for the uh, total manufacturing uh, sector. So it's very profitable, even comparing with the um, historical data, um, comparing with the, the year before. Um, I mean, compare, if you compare with the 21 
uh, manufacturing profits with the 2020, the grow, it grows up uh, by 16%. If you compare with the um, historical high uh, um, peak, um, the profit data is also uh, the number one, uh, the best year for this sector. Um, so the manufacturing sector become very confident and they invest a lot, um, but it's uh, just according to the external demand, not the domestic demand, and the sustainability is questionable. And for the first two months in China, uh, for the first two months in China, the investment of the manufacturing uh, is around 20%. But if you um, uh, look at the deflator, PPI inflation is around 10%. If you uh, divide it by the PI inflation, the manufacturing investment will be cut by half. Uh, it will be around 10%. Uh, not so strong as we uh, look, as we see for the nominal growth rate. And the second uh, part is for the, infra, uh, for the infrastructure infrastructure investments. <clears throat> the growth rate for the, for the first two months is around 8%. Um, and uh, the infrastructure investment, we know that it's uh, always invest, uh, mostly invested by local and the central government. And in this year, we expect a stable growth rates uh, for the infrastructure um, because the special bonds in special bonds insurance um, i mean the criteria uh, or the uh, the permission of the central government um, will be loosed uh, for the local government so they will, will be more easily to issue the special bonds uh, the special bonds in china means uh, the bonds will be uh, will finance a certain kind of project for the local government so uh, firstly, uh, the local government will design a basket of a uh, project, a special project. Um, for example, a subway or uh, an airport. Uh, I, and I first, I submit a kind of a certain uh, project. And the second, uh, the NDRC, uh, a very powerful, uh, very powerful and influential ministry. They will approve, uh, approve the project and and then you can um, the local government you can uh, issue your bond to finance the project but before this when you submit your project you should approve that uh, the project will be profitable you can get cash flow um, such kind of project will be sustainable uh, will not be a bad bad debt uh, will not be a, a bad project for the uh, for the fiscal uh, sector. Um, and in last year, in 21, the, uh, when the NDRC, I mean the powerful ministry, um, they will be reluctant to approve um, a new project. Um, the criteria could be very high and very strict. <clears throat> so the issuance of the special bonds uh, is, is very slow. But in this year, um, in order to stimulate the economy. Um, so the central government, they intended to uh, make the criteria, criteria uh, lower, uh, but the criteria lower is not mean that um, it's lower for the, for the green uh, consideration, uh, uh, carbon emission, uh, not in that way, but for the uh, cash flow. For example, some, uh, some project like a park, uh, for Chinese uh, uh, people like to dance, to dance and sing uh, in the park, uh, in a square. But the, the park is very popular, uh, but the park and the square, uh, when, it's, uh, when the project was complete, it could not be uh, profitable uh, because it's free and you cannot get the cash flow. Um, and in this year, the central government um, they lower they lower the uh, criteria to approve the, a special project, and in this way, the special bond was issued 
uh, very fast, much faster than last year. <clears throat> I will talk about this later in the second part about the policy framework of the uh, central government. And so the uh, infrastructure investment goes up. Um, the growth rate is uh, 8% in the first two months, much higher than last year. Uh, in last year, I remember in the second half, uh, second half of last year, the growth rate of infra infrastructure uh, almost a zero or negative. <clears throat> so this is one of the pillar to support the demand and support the growth rate. And the last investment is real estate. Um, the real estate sector, uh, which is the worst uh, situation uh, comparing with other uh, two sectors, um, because the real estate companies, they run out of money um, for, their, uh, for their financing. Some of the um, real estate companies are on the edge to be bankrupt and their volume are quite large. People's uh, investors are worried about um, the risk they will cause. Um, but in, in this year, the uh, policy uh, stance are also changed marginally, but not, not uh, change the direction. Uh, it's something like, uh, if you look at the regulation of the real estate in China, the regulation, uh, the policymaker play the play the regulation uh, like a play uh, um, like a play a song, a play a music. They just change the rhythm, but they didn't change the they doesn't change the melody. The melody is the same. Uh, that means um, the regulation for the real estate they didn't change the direction. Still very strict um, because the um, but 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 the regulation. Uh, policymakers, they did change the reason. Um, they lose, uh, they lose um, the policies in some cities, uh, in some ways, but not, uh, not as a whole situation. And the, why the uh, government are so strictly to contain the regulation policy framework for the real estate sector, um, because the financial risk is. Uh, potentially be a, a threat for China's economy in the, from the view of long run. When you check the history of the middle income country uh, for, the chap, for the chap of middle income, uh, you will find um, many of the country when they um, grow up uh, and the, the is, when they uh, get into the color of middle income countries, uh, some of the countries, they have um, suffered financial crisis and then go back to the low income countries level. And for China, um, we, we are especially paying much attention to the sustainability of the economic growth. Um, we hope that the growth model could be sustainable. Uh, when we just over, uh, pass over the, the level of the middle income, we, are, uh, pay, we will concern about the financial risks. And one of the major financial risks for China is the, uh, from the risk from the real estate sector. <clears throat> and uh, for China, the fundamental is also uh, changed. Like the, in the demo for the, for the population, China's, um, uh, China are changing from demographic dividend to demographic deficit, uh, more and more older people and less and less young young guys. Um, um, so it would be a fundamental change for the logic of a real estate and for the housing price. Um, this is the first. And the second is that um, we find that um, many of the house um, to, a, to a certain ratio, <clears throat> about 10%, 10% of the house of the uh, apartments are not bought by the people for them for for their use, uh, not used to live, but uh, used to hold as a kind of uh, financial assets. So it means a kind of bubble. Um, although the bubble uh, so far is still under control, but <clears throat> if you just let it go, the bubble could be um, 
bigger and bigger, like what happened by the end of 1980s in Japan and in some other countries. <clears throat> so when <clears throat> now we find the regulations are very strict and very decisive <clears throat> to control the bubble of real estate uh, sector. And even according, according to the fundamental like a demographic uh, structure, uh, we think that the uh, real estate company, real estate sector could be a kind of a drag to GDP growth, not like the years before it's a driver, uh, real estate or house, housing price is a driver to the GDP growth. In nowadays and the following years, uh, we can find it would be probably a kind of a drag. <clears throat> uh, okay, um, <clears throat> and the above is the three kind of investments. Uh, fixed asset investment. And last part is about exports. <clears throat> In last year, the export growth rate uh, is more than 30%. Uh, it's rather high uh, comparing with the history uh, level. But uh, there has a big background that in last year, in, for the global export, uh, global trade uh, growth rate is also very high. Uh, I think it's around 20%. But in this year, uh, the situation for the uh, global market is not good. Uh, just in yesterday or the day before, I noticed that the WTO has published a new forecasting that the export growth rate uh, would be like 2% or 3% um, in this year. Before, before they make this uh, revision of their forecasting, before this, uh, the forecasting is about 5%. And in last year, the, their forecasting is 10%. Now uh, it's only two uh, to 3% for the global trade. Uh, in China, it's a big challenge because the big background, um, the global trade growth rate is only uh, two or 3%. For China, it's almost impossible uh, to get the target like 10%. It's very hard. <clears throat> um, but I, I know some of the, um, my friends from overseas, they will, um, they will be worried about China's um, um, export compet compet competitiveness because the trade war between China and the US, also the uh, lockdown in these days. <clears throat> the lockdown is temporary, I believe, but for the trade war between China and the US, whether it will destroy or deteriorate China's uh, competitiveness. I think my, my answer is rather um, optimistic because the, uh, we can look at a very typical country uh, that is uh, Vietnam, just a neighbor to China and uh, benefit most between the China and the US trade war. Uh, Vietnam has uh, recorded a very high GDP growth rate for many years, it uh, excluded the uh, 20. Uh, 20. <clears throat> and you can find that uh, Vietnam uh, in last decade has become, uh, has changed from a small country for trade, for international trade, and now changed to be our middle or even a large um, trading partner, uh, trade partner in the global market. And <clears throat> I think China also benefits from Vietnam's economic growth. Uh, I can give you a case that uh, that is the point from China's exports. Uh, in one way, uh, we find uh, China exports to US declines to some extent. Um, before 21, China's exports to US, um, even before the pandemic, China's exports to US declines in terms of volume. And uh, even in, uh, 21, China's exports to US grows up uh, quickly, but the market ratio is still declines comparing with the year of uh, 17, uh, the year before, before the trade world uh, breakout. And, uh, um, <clears throat> but on, on, the other, on the other hand, you can find China's exports to V9 um, grows up even faster. And uh, the increase uh, the increase for China's export to Vietnam is much larger um, than the loss 
uh, between the bilateral trade with U.S. And, and uh, if you look at China's exports destination uh, countries um, in 10 years or 20 years ago, Vietnam ranked, oh, sorry, there's some noise. Uh, maybe my colleague, uh, or Ling Ling, Ling Ling or Ma, Ma Jingxing, mm. please uh, mute, mute. Mm, okay. <clears throat> uh, if you look at uh, the history of 10 or 20 years, Vietnam only ranked as uh, more than um, 20s as uh, China's export destination. It's a very small destination for China's exports. But in last year, Vietnam was the, the, uh, one of the largest uh, export destination. It ranked as a four, uh, ranked as fourth, just after the after uh, U.S., Japan, and the Korea, um, and the, it, it come very close to Korea. Um, and the China's exports to Vietnam, the volume is more than um, one hundred and twenty billion U.S. dollar. <clears throat> so Vietnam becomes one of the most important. Uh, uh, trade partners for China's exports. <clears throat> and not only Vietnam plays such kind of a role, but also for countries like Mexico, Malaysia, India, uh, uh, Bangladesh, and so on. Um, so many countries between China and the US, they uh, play the role as an uh, intermediate. Mm, and their relationship, their export relationship with China, I think, uh, the dominant relationship are not competitive uh, partners, but are more like a complementary uh, relationship. Um, so we benefit the, uh, the growth of, the, uh, of Vietnam. Uh, in this way, China's exports are also uh, not, so, uh, not so pessimistic. I'm, I'm um, rather, I think the, the future is uh, bright for China's exports, uh, for the market ratio. It, it will not be uh, destroyed by the trade war between China and the US. Actually, we think what kind of power could uh, destroy China's GDP growth, uh, economic growth? Uh, I think it's not the US uh, trade war. Um, because since the year of 2018, China's uh, exports in the global market uh, our market share uh, increased continuously since the year of 18 and in last year. Um, so far, the, the export market ratio in the global market is historically high. Uh, it's about 16%. Before, this, before the China and uh, US trade war in 17, the market ratio of China's export is only uh, like around 14%, according to our uh, calculation. So 2% increase for the market share. 1% uh, increase is very, um, uh, it's not easy uh, because it's uh, the global market. <clears throat> and I think the only power can, can influence China's development is ourselves. So the most important thing for China is to practice the policy well, uh, according to ourselves, to do the things better uh, for ourselves, not to uh, pay much, too, too much attention to the relations between China and the US. Um, so the, uh, this is my, uh, my private view. <clears throat> okay, and let me go to, I find that there are some um, questions. Actually, I have uh, the second part for the policy uh, framework. Um, let me firstly look at the questions. The first question um, is raised by, Karad Raka, I'm not sure whether the pronunciation is right. Um, how you see the perspectives of China, Chinese policy, zero COVID tolerance, new Omicron variant is not, uh, is not so dangerous. It's like a regular flu and the locked, lockdowns cause high economic cost for economy. Um, first, um, thank you for your question. Uh, I agree with you that the, the lockdowns cost is very high. <clears throat> uh, 
and uh, for China's zero uh, COVID strategy, uh, I think it's not so accurate. Uh, yeah, we, we want to be zero COVID, but uh, it could be impossible. For China, our strategy is dynamic, dynamic zero uh, tolerance. <clears throat> but uh, even, even for the dynamic zero COVID strategy, we, also, uh, we are also facing big challenges. And in these days, I think the strategy are uh, changed uh, in some way, uh, are not so uh, stri strict as before. Um, first in Shanghai, um, the, the policy framework was uh, changed. Um, before, um, I think two weeks ago, they have to um, test, test the COVID, uh, COVID uh, whether uh, themselves are positive or negative, uh, they should go outside and uh, uh, they have to wait in line, in a long line uh, together to make the test. And in, I think about two, two weeks ago, the policy was changed that you can buy the, uh, you, can, you can buy the, uh, the things and you can test yourself at your home and then report the results to the government or to the medical system. That means uh, the strategy is uh, changed. Um, and the second is um, in yesterday, the policy, um, the policy makers have published that for eight cities, um, when the foreigner uh, enter into the board, um, I mean, the, the people fly from, uh, they take the flight from Hungary uh, or from Japan, when they get into the board of China, <clears throat> uh, before yesterday, they have to to be uh, quarantined. Um, they have to be uh, uh, quarantined for about three weeks, uh, 14 plus seven days. Um, so long a period for quarantine. But in yesterday, the new policy, um, Cut the cut the period uh, for quarantine, and it's uh, only uh, uh, maybe only it's not uh, not good. Uh, but the the quarantine period declines to ten plus seven, uh, seventeen days. Still quite long, I know, comparing with your policies. But uh, marginally, the policy was changed. Um, and the eight cities, including Shanghai, and also Shenzhen. Uh, Xiamen, Chengdu, uh, and other major cities in China, but not including Beijing. <clears throat> um, I think in many ways, uh, many signals, signals uh, tell us that the policies are changed uh, marginally, but not, uh, not totally changed. Um, we have to wait and see. So this is the answer for the first question. Uh, thank you. And second is, <clears throat> a uh, uh, long list for the question. The first one is in 21, the GDP growth rate was at uh, 8%. Could you please inform which were the sector that mostly contributed to, the, to this growth considering the restrictions? <clears throat> um, this question, um, uh, th thank you. I think um, the two parts, two of the sectors contribute the most to the GDP growth in, 20, uh, in 21. And uh, the first from the expenditure way, from the demand way, that is the external demand. I have just mentioned the exports growth rate in last year, last year is 30%, uh, which is a, a very uh, significant driver for China's GDP. And the second perspective is from the supplies, uh, supply side. Uh, uh, that is the agriculture or manufacturing or service. Um, my answer is for manufacturing. Uh, the manufacturing, uh, I have ju just mentioned before, is extremely profitable, especially for the upper stream uh, industries. <clears throat> but the, the situations for the lower, for the down uh, stream industries, the situations is not still not good in last year. But for the upper stream industries, uh, for the rural uh, materials, for the core, 
um, for the chemistry, um, for the uh, steel, iron, um, they are very profitable. And also the uh, medical, uh, medical uh, system. <clears throat> and uh, this is my answer, export for the demand and uh, manufacturing in the supply side. They are the major uh, contribution for GDP growth in last year. But in this year, uh, these two pillars, the sustainability uh, could be to some extent uh, questionable. Um, so that's why we actively uh, to give advice um, that the government, the fiscal policy should take the, uh, should take the position. The second question uh, from Marcela is, according to the government's work report of March, the Chinese economy is expected to grow at 5.5. After the Ukraine crisis, many financial institutions revised their projections for 2020. Uh, in your opinion, will China revise its projections considering also the current lockdowns? Um, thank you for your question. Uh, it's really a, good, a very good question. Uh, actually, it's also a controversial issue in China's uh, domestic circles. Uh, in these days, we are uh, discuss about this question. Um, from my private view, I think the uh, it's reasonable that to make some revision of the uh, economic growth rates because the uh, Ukraine crisis, uh, the, the war was out of our expectation. Um, the war was broke out at uh, February 23rd, um, and uh, the last version of the government report or the target of GDP growth rate was settled just a week before the, uh, before the war uh, or before the crisis. Um, and I think there's no time for the uh, government to, re, to rethink about the, uh, the framework or the system of the index like uh, GDP growth rate, inflation, employment ratio, uh, and the deficit and so on is uh, they have no time to change the whole system of the economic uh, in index in just in one week. And they have to translate them into different various languages uh, in different kinds of versions in English, uh, in Hungarian and so on. Um, so the, uh, but you can find uh, very interesting in the government report. There is <clears throat> one word, uh, one sentence. It was said that we should have pipelines uh, for the macroeconomic, macroeconomic policies. We should have pipelines and we should uh, uh, use the pipelines uh, in time. I think that uh, this unusual uh, description um, is, could probably be uh, added uh, in that week uh, to, to make the policy room bigger, to make the to make it possible that the deficit ratio could be a little higher uh, than uh, it was settled in the government report as 2.8%. Uh, and why not to increase the deficit ratio to a little bit higher than 3%? I think it's possible. Um, so in, in two ways, we, uh, we should adjust the um, policy framework. One is to, um, to make, uh, to employ, uh, a more expansionary um, fiscal policy or monetary policy. And the second is to adjust a little bit uh, for the uh, economic growth targets um, because our target is not ac accurately uh, for 5.5. Uh, the target is described as around 5.5. Uh, uh, so 5.3 is also around 5.5, uh, 5.2, is it around? I'm not sure, but uh, maybe uh, it's also uh, around. Um, so 5.5 is not a very strict uh, red line. Uh, it could be lower uh, than the target. <clears throat> this is the answer for the question. Um, another question is from Ladis Love. Um, you have mentioned the three major challenges for China's market mechanism, supply, demand, and uh, expectation. How do you evaluate possible impacts of the current Ukraine, Ukraine uh, crisis and the West conflict with Russia on these three areas? 
and on the performance of the Chinese economy as a whole. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, the crisis are, I think it is a, uh, to some extent a big shock for, um, for the world economy. But um, if you just look at these two economies uh, for their volume, um, the Russia's GDP uh, only shares about 2% of the global GDP. Uh, Ukraine is even small, a small ratio of the global GDP. So just in terms of the GDP uh, ratio, uh, the world between these two countries are not so influential <clears throat> to the countries. <clears throat> Why we are so concerned about the crisis and their uh, shock to the economy is about the commodity price, <clears throat> especially for the energy uh, price, uh, the gas and the oil, and also for the, uh, for the food, for the wheat. Um, <clears throat> I think for China, we, are, we were uh, influenced by uh, a less, <clears throat> to a less extent, <clears throat> China was influenced because China has an abundance of uh, food um, inv uh, inventory. Uh, China has the largest food inventory uh, in the world, I think. Um, according to my knowledge, the food, um, <clears throat> the stock of the food are as much as, the, as, much as uh, 20% of the annual production uh, of the agriculture. Um, what, what's the controversial issue for China uh, in this area is about, is too much of cost. Every year we cost, we cost uh, 200 billion Chinese yuan to maintain such a huge uh, food stock <clears throat> for the uh, national uh, level. But uh, in this year, um, uh, it means China will be um, influenced less uh, in the, for the food price. And the second for the energy price, <clears throat> China will be uh, influenced uh, rather, uh, uh, rather uh, more seriously because China is one of the major or uh, even the largest imports, uh, import country of the energy, especially for oil. Um, in this way, China could be uh, could got, got some loss and uh, our trade conditions are getting serious. Um, one of my colleagues, they have made calculations that when uh, the oil price increase $1 or $10, China will get lost uh, by how much million uh, US dollar uh, as a, uh, in the national level. Um, so it will really be a kind of uh, loss for China. And at the same time, uh, through the imports, we, it will um, increase the pressure for uh, inflation. Um, so it's in, imports, imports inflation. But so far for our economy, our major challenge is still uh, the demand, the weak demand I have mentioned before. Uh, so far we didn't find a serious inflation pressure. <clears throat> so this is my answer for this question. Um, and uh, the question from Joseph mentioned China is benefiting from growth of Vienna, but as more as uh, more and more South East Asian countries receiving manufacturing order from the world, as India is producing iPhone 13 now. What's your opinion on China's role in these circumstances? Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you for this question. Um, for China's uh, entrepreneurship, um, I think what's their um, um, I appreciate China's entrepreneurship when I make some investigations and make interviews with them um, because they can accustom uh, accustom uh, accustom to the different very difficult situations and uh, they can learn the new technology and the new information very quickly. They are very international. <clears throat> um, I can give you a, a joke and then give you a data. Uh, to, uh, to to argue uh, that not defense uh, to argue that China's competitiveness in the international trade. One is that uh, the joke is that the 
Japanese economy, very famous uh, Japanese economy. Um, he told me um, that when he give when he uh, give a presentation uh, in Japan, the audience are um, the boss from big companies in Japan, and uh, he give the presentation in English. Um, the audience, uh, I mean the Japanese uh, big boss, uh, they they get the head of them. And uh, they will, uh, of course, they can listen to the English, but at the same time, they listen to the uh, instance uh, inter um, interpreters. And when uh, when a very famous uh, economist they give the presentation, they give a uh, and uh, he said a joke. After uh, ten minutes or fifteen minutes, um, the Japanese big boss uh, they they laugh loudly. Uh, they they understand what's the joke, but just after ten or fifteen minutes, and in China when the the same uh, I mean the the economist a very famous economist he told the same exactly the same joke to Chinese audience uh, also are big boss uh, even some of them most of them are from SOEs I mean state state owned uh, enterprises uh, when he told the joke uh, just at the same time, uh, most of the people are uh, laugh loudly. Uh, that means he told me the joke uh, because he he appreciated that Chinese uh, um, entrepreneurship they are very international. Their view are uh, very widely, and they can absorb a new new kind of a new business model, uh, new thinking. Uh, and so this is the joke. And second, I give you a data that China's exports to the global market. What kind of exports? Uh, not only iPhone um, and not only mask, uh, masks and uh, ventilator. I got the data. Uh, I am also astonished. That's the new energy, new energy vehicle, new energy automobiles. The market share for China's exports was more than 50%, five zero, more than 50%, especially for the full electricity vehicle. The market share for China's exports in the global market is more than 75%, three quarters market share. Um, and for the solar panel modules, uh, the market share is about 90%, nine zero. Very large uh, market share. I know there's another kind of uh, question. Uh, I listened, I joined some of the um, meetings, conference with uh, European friends. Uh, you are worried about that we are, uh, European economies are getting too much dependent to China's export, to China's economy. I can understand that uh, your worry, but um, when we just look at the competitiveness, uh, China's export competitiveness is not only limited to the labor intensive industry, but also in the emerging technology, emerging green, Area, uh, so the competitiveness is um, even surprised me. Um, when you see some of the traditional uh, industries, a uh, supply chain was changed, moved from China to India to Vietnam. I am not so worried about this uh, because there are uh, many many emerging economies, new emerging uh, industries are developed very well in China. So this is my answer. <clears throat> Um, another, uh, the last question is, oh, uh, okay, it's not a question. Uh, I think I used up my time. Hmm. I will give back my, uh, give back to the moderator, my colleague, Ma, Ma Jinxin. Hey. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, for Professor and thank you very much for the response to the questions and uh, comments. Uh, in this lecture, Professor Xu shared so much detailed economic days and uh, yesterday for us, uh, China's economy is projected to slow in 2022 and the slowdown reflects less favorable base efforts, diminished support from exports, 
and the government has contributed the developing efforts. So the growth is projected to slow in this year. Uh, in this year, I think not only the COVID-19 will make a pressure, but also the challenges from the rebalancing from the external to domestic demand and from the investment and the industry led the growth to greater reliance on the consumptions and the service. And um, okay, so, thank you very much for the, all the pa participants and uh, thank you again for Professor Xu's contribution. Okay, see you, see you next lecture. Thank you. Thank you for everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.